so it's wonderful to meet you today. And uh, in the beginning, we would love to know a little bit about yourself and your work and how your work is addressing some of the contemporary global challenges, including the challenges around global health, livelihoods, etc. And of course, what inspires you to do what you do? Well, it's a delight to meet you both. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I came out of the women's movement. First of all, I'm Canadian. I live in Canada. I live in Ottawa, the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Um, I came out of the women's movement and got very involved in um, fighting big parts of economic globalization, which I thought was the wrong model for the economic model for the world back in the 1980s, 1990s, the early 2000s. Um, and that meant fighting deregulation and privatization and the growth of large corporations. Just a reminder of the 100 largest economies in the world, 69 are corporations and 31 are countries. So, you know, you see the power imbalance that this led to. And of course, we know the inequality that exists in our world, in all of our countries and, and among nations. Um, so that was a big part of my work. And then I discovered when I was reading the, one of the first of these free trade agreements, one that became the model, which was between Canada and the United States back in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan was the president. We weren't fond of Ronald Reagan. We didn't want him dictating Canadian policy. And we had a right wing Margaret Thatcher type uh, government in Canada, Brian Mulroney. Um, and so when I, I, we were fighting this free trade agreement, and I noted that in the annex that listed all of the tradable goods that now had to be, governments had to sort of hands off because of now the, the discipline of this trade agreement was going to hand it over to the market, <clears throat> was water in all its forms, including ice and snow. And I remember it was just like an epiphany. I thought, what are they talking about? How can water be a tradable good? I don't understand. And I did realize at the time when we were fighting this that there were huge um, projects planned to bring Canadian water uh, commercially to pipe it down to the thirsty parts of the United States and the West, Southwest. Um, and we were fighting to stop that because that would be an ecological disaster. Um, and so I realized then that this free trade agreement was meant to turn the tap on and there would be very little ability to turn the tap off. And I started to look at Margaret Thatcher in Great Britain who was uh, privatizing water there and the World Bank that was telling poor countries in the global south you have to um, you you have to uh, if you want funding for water services you have to go to a private a corporation we're not going to help you put in a public system and I was beginning to understand that we which I now understand a lot more that we are a planet running out of clean accessible water which you know, sounds crazy because we were all raised to believe that there's a finite amount of water and it can't go anywhere, but we are polluting, diverting, over extracting, damming it, damming the rivers to death. And we are a planet where the, the uh, demand is going straight up and the supply is going straight down. That led me to understand that there would be a mighty contest or it had already started between those who wanted to see water as a commodity to be put on the open market like oil and gas and those of us who said it's a, a commons, a public trust, um, a human right. And those are two profoundly different ways of looking at it. So I became deeply, deeply involved as I learned all this and started to learn about the human, the human dimension of the, the water crisis, um, which you know is terrible in, in many, many parts of the world, but I would say is coming in every part of the world. And so it just set me on a journey. Uh, I've written many books on it, many reports. Um, was had the honor of advising uh, <clears throat> in 2009, 10, the then president of the UN General Assembly when we brought in um, a resolution to have water declared, a water and sanitation declared fundamental basic human rights. So that just led to the building of a global movement to um, really demand that water uh, and sanitation be, be understood to be not an issue of charity, but an issue of justice. And that we had to take uh, control of this in local communities in indigenous communities. It was very much an issue for women, of course. Um, <clears throat> so it was just an odd tr trip for me from the women's movement to economic globalization and with the water movement to an extent back to women, because of course, uh, as you know, in, in many places, it's a woman's role to go 
get find the water in the morning. She takes her girl children out of school to go with her. So it's very much an issue for of equality and opportunity for women um, to deal with the sanitation issue. And then of course, along comes COVID. And we know that more than half the population of the world doesn't have a place to wash its ha their hands with soap and warm water, which we were all told right away, the first thing before vaccines, anything, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Yeah. Um, and so that this really, COVID really put a spotlight on the crisis that we're dealing with. And it's just been a, a huge and very important part of my life and part of the work that I do with the uh, Right Livelihood. So, so coming out of all of uh, those uh, movement projects and, and all of your analyses that you've just outlined there from the, from the um, critiques of the commodification of water uh, and the uh, crit critiques of neoliberal globalization, your involvement in the women's movement. Um, uh, could you talk a little bit more about how our current crisis, particularly the, the COVID crisis, has, has spotlighted it in your mind, that, and to use your term spotlight, how it spotlighted the sort of intersection of all of these dynamics in... Um, in, in the way that they come together and make people vulnerable? Well, <clears throat> even though the planet is running out of clean water, of course, for those who have money and power, there's any amount of water for the golf courses, for your swimming pools, for your resorts, for whatever you want. Um, and of course, it's people, poor people, indigenous people, peasants, um, pe poor people in first so-called first world countries as well. I mean, the, the, the larger numbers, of course, are in the global south, but each year in the United States, the water is cut off to about 15 million people because they simply do not have the uh, ability to pay the water bill. I call it the perfect storm <clears throat> of declining water stocks and water quality, access to clean water itself. Um, the growing inequality in our world and the inability of people to be able to buy it. And then the rising water prices, which very often is a result of, of water privatization because the big for-profit companies come in and take over. So the intersectionality here is very much part of the whole dynamic of environmental racism. You get mining companies, and I hate to say it, I'm embarrassed about it, but many times they're Canadian mining companies. For instance, going into countries in Africa or South America, and getting contracts of 100 years to access the water there to do their mining and they dump their toxins into the, into the water, poisoning it, poisoning it for generations to come. Um, totally legal, they basically own that water. That's another form of, of water privatization and water com uh, commodification. Uh, and so you see this um, situation where the, the crisis becomes much more dire for uh, people of color for indigenous people, for women, um, for people in um, communities where there is you know, no basic running water. Uh, and it, it, so the fight for justice is extremely important to place it in that larger framework of the fight for equality, the fight for power, <clears throat> the, the, the identification of class issues as well. This is, this is uh, absolutely crucial to the, to the fight as we see it. Um, and as, when we talk about it as a women's movement uh, issue, it's partly, of course, because as I said earlier, women are the ones who go out and get it and are responsible for the health of the family, preparing the food, taking care of the kids and so on, all the things you need water for. But I, I would say that there's a very special connection women have to water, um, giving life, um, you know, raising children. It's um, it, it's a, it, it comes back really to, t to talk to us about fundamental values. But I wanna say, and I, I just, uh, we were talking earlier before we got on here formally that I've just written a, a new book on hope that comes out in a few months. And I really wanna talk about what we are learning and the hopeful signs, because I think it's really um, um, tempting to just tell the bad story because then there are bad stories. I mean, two, 2.4 billion people don't have access to clean water and 4.2 billion people don't have access to basic sanitation. It's really stunning statistics. It is the greatest human rights threat of our, of our time. But there had, the COVID virus, the pandemic has really shone a spotlight on this. 
And although there haven't been any studies that show this globally, I have collected a lot of information anecdotally where I know that aid agencies and governments with funding that is going to COVID, uh, the COVID crisis in countries of the global south is going to uh, set up permanent sanitation structures. And so it's not just for the COVID crisis, but understanding that you can't deal with this with A, without vaccines for everybody, which is another right. part of this story, of course, but without clean water. I mean, there are countries where most of the, the health clinics don't have running water. How do you deal with health in a health clinic with no running water? Add to that a pandemic and it's terrible. So I think people have understood just as we're saying, you know, there was a book written a number of years ago, One World Ready or Not. If anything COVID has taught us, it's one world ready or not. Vaccine wise, it's also that way um, with water. And um, so I'm the hopeful part of me says we're going to learn a lot of things or we are, have learned a lot of things from this crisis, including what matters and perhaps less competitiveness, less individual, you know, me, me, yeah. me, and much more collective thinking and caring, people caring for their neighbors, people looking after one another whole concept of being kind and understanding uh, how hard this has been for so many people <clears throat> and understanding that it's not going to be okay for some until it's okay for everyone and it's really important that we um, we come to this issue um, in that framework. So you've already transitioned beautifully to another question that we wanted to I have ask. a bad habit of doing that. <laughs> well no it's great but we wanted basically to ask about responses and and you've already now talked about responding with hope, but there was a really interesting thing that you used to pivot from the nature of the crisis and all of the inequalities in the crisis to that moment of hope and response, which is you talked about how we um, need to think about systems. You like it's not just about tackling the virus, but uh, building something like um, a water and sanitation system alongside. Uh, the, the sort of more uh, biomedical intervention of the vaccine. And um, I think that's a really important lesson for all of us, and especially our students, to think about that responses in terms of systems building. How do we build health systems? How do we build um, infrastructures that are more inclusive and address uh, cr chronic and structural forms of inequality and, and, and I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how in <laughs> practice we do that kind of pivot. Uh, it's easy enough for us in the, in the classroom <laughs> to sort of talk about it, but on the ground, like how do we respond in a way that we're, where we kind of go from the immediacy of the, of the health crisis to this broader kind of system-based approach to responding? Well, it's really important, and thank you for a great question, that we re realize that we need to keep public democratic control of water. If we are, as I know we are, and don't take my word for it, <laughs> the UN will tell you, anybody who's studying this, that we are a planet running out of clean water, and we are going to have to do, we are going to have to care for water in a very, in a profoundly different way, change our relationship to water. We're going to have to learn from indigenous teachings that we are water, we are nature, we're not saving nature, we're saving ourselves by <clears throat> caring about and seeing the, the need to protect Mother Earth. This is profoundly important and I've been part of a group called the Global Alliance on the Rights of Mother Earth or the Rights of Nature. Um, this is really important uh, change in our, in our mindset that we're not the dominant species. Um, and, and recognizing that and recognizing that water and sanitation or human rights was, uh, our human rights was a very important step. You would think that's just a motherhood. Right? Of course, water is a human right. Well, let me tell you, we fought it. And the country that was at the time, this was back in 2000, during the early 2000s, and then we got the resolution in 2010, July 28th. My government in Canada, we had a right-wing government under Stephen Harper. He led the fight against the human right to water because we have a lot of Indigenous communities in Canada, First Nations communities, <clears throat> that don't have proper drinking water and sanitation uh, 
uh, processors or services. And they didn't want to, uh, groups like ours being able to say, now we've got this statement, this resolution at the UN and, and look what you're doing. So, but the US was opposed to it, Great Britain was opposed to it, it the World Bank was opposed to it, all the big water companies, of course, were opposed to it. They wanted to continue to suck, you know, to pump this water up for profit. Um, but we got it, we got our resolution. And since then, and in my, in my view, the, the, you, the world's family took a, an evolutionary step forward on July 28th, 2010, when we adopted this resolution, because we said it's not an issue of charity. Oh, there's a need there. Let's just fill it with charity uh, or not. Um, but it's a human right. It's an issue of justice. And this is a really different way of looking at protecting both the environment and people and other species. Um, so, and since then, almost four dozen um, countries have either amended their constitution or brought in new laws to guarantee the human right to water. We have quite a number of very important court cases that have referred to the resolution and <clears throat> restored the human right to water in communities. It's been a, a really important um, tool for us, a, an important a gem for us to hold in our hands. Did everything become right? okay right away? Of course not. We're in a race against the destruction that we're doing to the world's water. As we move forward, and you can have all the human rights in the world, if the water isn't there, the water isn't there. So we have to marry these two movements, the, the scientific ecological movement to protect water and watersheds and restore them, and uh, to share water more justly. To do all of that, we have to challenge the precepts of economic globalization, which was the Bible when I was doing my original work. During the 1980s, 1990s, everybody said economic globalization, deregulation, privatization, free trade agreements, giving corporations the right to sue governments in trade and investment agreements, terrific. It'll rise all boats. The big yachts will rise and the little fishing boats will rise. And of course, none of that happened except for the big boats rising. In fact, the UN now tells us that three quarters of the world's working age population is in the, the pro, uh, is in the precariat. They don't have access to, to secure jobs, secure uh, pay, sick leave, pensions, none of that. Three quarters of the world, and it's not just in the global south. This is uh, the, the countries of the global north are going through the same transition, all the with the gig economy and so on. So it turns out all that didn't work out that well. And I, I think COVID exposed that. You even get organizations like the International Monetary Fund that was so gung-ho on economic globalization and privatized this and privatized that and force it on the global south. Now saying report after report after report, they sound like me. They're saying it didn't work privatization failed um, the supply chain, privatization failed the vaccine rollout. Um, we need governments to come back in for healthcare, for food, uh, to, to provide food for their, their, their people. So I think what COVID has done along with this water crisis and the climate crisis to show that we need the rule of law. Uh, Martin Luther King said, legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. We need the rule of law. And we need it at the nation state level, the, the lower levels, the municipal and so on. We also need it at the international level. And so far the law has favored these trade agreements and these investment agreements that lock in corporate privilege and corporate power and the power of the market. And I see a tremendous opportunity for this to shift now. And this means you, you do all of this with the eye to the deep inequalities that economic globalization spawned. We have to have what Kate Raworth has called the donut economy instead of this notion of unlimited growth, never stop, tape down more forests, open up more water, waterways to commercial <clears throat> enterprise, you know, no, more, more big ag, no. We come back to a very different model where we say, what are the outer limits of, of the, the um, environment to be able to sustain us? And what are the inner limits of this or the inner requirements of this donut to provide for the, the rights of people, housing and food and education, and healthcare and so on? <clears throat> and then how do you build an economy that isn't built on the destruction of nature? And for a country like ours, which is just a resource uh, provider, we just, we just give everything away, we sell it for nothing. <clears throat> we don't require that we take care of our, our water or anything else. 
And I say that with love of my country, but we have not done this well. Um, this is a really powerful and important lesson to learn. So yes, protect water, protect the human right to water, protect the water as a public trust. And then within the larger framework, we have to challenge what I call savage capitalism. Uh, there's a place for the private sector. I'm not saying that, but what is the balance that we need? It's gone way over to the other side and we have to pull it back. Thank you. I think it's so inspiring. I, you know, I just feel like listening more and more to uh, you know what you have been doing. That's you know really wonderful. Um, so uh, you know, and uh, you know, something that also struck me was uh, you know you're talking about this um, you know an interior south within the global north. Just we have an exterior north within the global south, and of course uh, you know the larger dynamics, globalization, and all of that, and how within that addressing inequalities and indigenous so of course what you have said is a you know what would be a way forward so uh, just the last question would be is there anything uh, you know within the present context that you would want to prioritize in terms of a way forward and uh, finally uh, you know uh, if we are if uh, we were all to collaborate for this uh, you know, moving towards this path of rights and justice. Um, so how, how do you think we can collaborate with you as a laureate and with students uh, and faculty of the Right Livelihood Colleges? What would be those possibilities? Well, two things come to mind. The first is exactly what you said and reflecting back on something I said earlier. And that is we can't think of the problems in the global south and everything's fine in the global north. It isn't fine in the global north. In fact, one of the books I wrote recently, a couple of years ago, was on Canada's water crisis. People say, what, you've got 20% of the world's water. Well, not true, number one, but number two, we are not protecting it. You know, in, in, in the so-called water rich countries, we are destroying our water or we're selling it or we're, you know, we're using it to make money. We're allowing massive profit to be taken from it. So <clears throat> I would argue that it's really important for us to, to, uh, to really come together for, and, and understand how this is, it's, it, it is, as I said earlier, one world ready or not. We have a project called Blue Communities and Blue Communities is where a municipality pledges to um, <clears throat> protect water as a human right to protect it as a public trust, so no privatization, and where clean water is coming out of the taps, and I realize that's not everywhere, but certainly in North America, it pretty well is, that we're gonna to start to do phase out bottle, plastic bottled water, because we have to do something with this awful plastics crisis that we have. But we, what we understand is that as we spread this concept, that we, we, we know that we have to do it together. We can't say, oh, it's a problem just over there. In uh, Los Angeles, for instance, which just became a blue community two years ago, there are over a million people in the greater Los Angeles area that do not have access to clean water and sanitation. You know, you think of it as a problem for some countries and not others, not the wealthier countries, but I promise you, <clears throat> we are dividing uh, wealth and, and poverty in, in uh, so many countries. But I'd also like to say, and I know we have to finish soon, I would like uh, the, our students, your students, and everyone connected to the right livelihood to really, uh, to an extent, separate water from climate. Now, the climate change, when we think of it, we think of it as fueled by greenhouse gas emissions and other fossil fuels and methane and so on, and that's, and that that is bad for water. And that's true, it's melting glaciers, thirsty forests and thirsty crops, you know, where water scarce areas are drinking up more water. Um, it, uh, climate change warms the lakes and rivers, which makes them evaporate more quickly. So yes, but what we don't talk about is separately is that the way we are destroying water, removing vegetation or removing water from a particular area, over extracting it, damming it, using it for flood irrigation is in itself a great cause of climate crisis. And, it, and restore, protecting and restoring watersheds and using water properly and protecting it is one of the great solutions to the climate crisis. And this is really important. And so I would like to, because I believe that if we could end every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow, we would still have a water crisis. And they say, you know, they'll say climate change is causing drought in Brazil for the first time. No, it's not climate change. It's because they're cutting down the Amazon. And the Amazon gives off amazing amounts of 
vapor, which is carried in these atmospheric rivers, which then carry the rain down to the south. You cut the trees, the rain doesn't, the rain isn't, isn't there. It is not, it's not, the atmospheric rivers are reduced or gone. Um, the formal Aral Sea, it was a, 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 a lake so big in the former uh, uni, uh, Soviet Union that it was uh, the fourth largest lake in the world. <clears throat> almost gone now. It's just almost gone. Uh, the, the, the photos of it are just stunning. That's not climate change. That's over extraction. They decided they wanted to use the water to grow, to grow cotton in the desert, and they just drank that water up until it was gone. <clears throat> so it's very important that we have an eye for this because water is going is the first sign of cli the climate crisis. Sometimes you'll hear it's people are moving from from uh, starvation, but that might and likely did start with drought. There's, there's starvation because there's no food because there's no water. And so I would like for us to, to really think about this and teach our students and have them explore the, the issues around the connection between the human right to water, environmental racism <clears throat> and protection of the planet, including how protection and expansion of the concepts of, of, of the rights of water um, can impact uh, the climate crisis. Oh. And another piece of good news, just because I want to throw something in there, and that is that the Human Rights Council at the UN recently recognized the right to a human right to a healthy environment, which was led by another Canadian. His name is David Boyd. Um, he's the special UN Special Rapporteur on Environment and Human Rights. He's been pushing this for years, and a number of countries have adopted their uh, constitutions to, to recognize the, the, the right to a, a healthy environment. But he says, if you want to protect the environment, add it or place it, frame it in human rights language, because that's stronger. If you can get it into the constitution of individual countries, you will have protections for the environment uh, and the climate um, through the lens of, of human rights. And so uh, there are good things happening. And, and I just, and I know we have to end I quote, uh, quoting Rebecca Solnit, who wrote a wonderful book called Hope in the Dark. And she said, because I've been in writing this book, I've been thinking about realizing you're not alone and you can't take everything on your own shoulders and you have to assume that there are so many things going on, so many good uh, projects and, and, and no, so much good work going on that we can't know about. We have to have some faith that there is this greater human uh, bond that we have and this greater human force, if you will. Rebecca Solnit said, progress isn't an army marching forward. It's a crab scuttling sideways. You know, you don't know where it's gonna come from. You can't anticipate it. All you can do is, is say to yourself every day, I feel overwhelmed, but what is the next appropriate step to take? And you take it and you, assume, you have to assume that others are taking an appropriate yeah. step. And all of our students are going to be uh, trying to take those steps, uh, crab-like sideways as they navigate this crisis and, and navigate um, our course uh, together. Um, and I think you've given them so much to think about uh, as they do that. Well, what, it, one of the things I remember reading from Rebecca Solnit is that um, she, she was also quite skeptical and critical of, of false hope. Uh, of, of hope that's sort of naive and and just sort of like wishful thinking and and instead urges us to have hopes but have them uh, that are based on uh, on a realistic assessment of what we're up against and you've given us such a good uh, outline of of things that we're up against especially in relationship to access to water so thank you so much for all of that you, you've reminded us that that the right to water isn't isn't something that can be delivered in a plastic bottle and um, uh, commodified and, and packaged for us. It has to be something that's that struggled for as a right. And that's such a, a valuable insight. So many, many thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks both. <laughs>